in the reading assignment and in lectures, you saw how when you are given um, some irrotational field F and you're told that its divergence is equal to some charge density rho, charge density, and this would be the vector field produced by this charge density, field produced. You saw how to use divergence theorem to get from this point form to this integral expression, where on the left-hand side, you would have outward flux of the vector field. through the surface uh, S equal to, on the right-hand side, to the total charge enclosed inside of the surface. In section 3.3, the problems involved were spherically symmetric, uh, and the charge density was only a function of the distance from the origin. So it didn't depend on the phi and it didn't depend on theta. Um, as a result of this, the vector field produced is going to be a function, uh, is going to be in the radial direction And its magnitude is only going to be a function of the distance from the origin. So here I sketched f, which is equal to some function of the distance from the origin times r hat. Now, if f of r is negative, then the field is going to be converging on this sphere that I've shown here. Uh, Gaussian surfaces, which is the surface S here, that are good for this kind of problems would be spheres and the reason they are good choice for this kind of problems is that the vector field f is parallel to the normal vector of the surface and also the magnitude of this field is constant everywhere on the surface so the flux integral calculation on the left-hand side becomes much simpler. Let me show you. You have the left-hand side of the divergence theorem. Then here I plugged in the expression for f, and I, I plugged in, instead of generic r, I plugged in the r on the surface, so the radius of the sphere. And then we have r hat dotted with the surface element of this sphere. Now, f of rs is just a constant, so it comes out of the integral, and you're left with this integral here. Now, r hat and ds go in the same direction, right? So, n hat is in this direction, so ds is also in this same direction. which means that when I take a dot product between ds and r hat, I get, um, I get the magnitude of ds. Let me explain why this happens. We know that r hat dotted with ds is equal to magnitude of r hat, which is 1, multiplied by magnitude of ds, which is just scalar ds, times the cosine of the angle be between them. But if they are parallel, then the angle between them is 0. So this cosine is 1. So we just end up with ds. So this expression is just ds. So we get this here. Now, this integral is just the surface area of, of the sphere 
which is equal to 4 pi r squared. Now, what's really important is that none of this would have been possible, um, none of these simplifications would be possible if the sphere, um, if the Gaussian surface didn't respect the symmetry of the problem. If either the problem wasn't spherically symmetric or instead of the sphere, I chose a cube or some other kind of surface. Here's the steps where it's really important. You see how here I was able to take f of rs out of the integral? I could only do this because f is a function of, uh, of the distance from the origin, which is constant on the surface of the sphere. Now, if f was a function of phi and theta, it would have to stay inside the integral. Also, here I used the fact that r hat and ds are parallel, which is the case because of the way I chose the surface. Now, this integration here is a shortcut, and it's probably not how you're used to doing this. You're more used to parameterizing the surface and performing the integration this way. So I will show you, in case you're curious, how it would look like. You would parameterize the surface in terms of phi and theta, giving you this expression here. Then you would compute t phi and t theta and take a cross product, which gives you this. Um, I'm going to factor out rs squared sine phi. You'll see later why. It's just to see some things more clearly. Um, we will get sine phi cos theta sine phi sine theta. and um, cos phi, and then here is rs squared sine phi. Next step is to uh, get um, vector field on the surface written in terms of phi and theta. Here I wrote f equals f of rs because we plugged in the radius of the sphere. r hat, r hat I wrote in terms of phi and theta here. And then you would need to perform the integration. The, uh, the, the integral would look like this. Theta would be going from 0 to 2 pi. Pi would be going from 0 to pi. Then you have the vector field. Then you have this factor here. And then you have d phi d theta. Then you would plug in the expression for f which I'm showing you here, this part is this I thing I just showed you over here. And then you have d phi d theta, which is equal to this. If you, you would need to first, um, you would need to uh, figure out what this dot product is. And if you work out all the math, you would find that this dot product with this is equal to 1. So then you take f of rs, you can take it out of the integral, you would get f of rs times integral 0 to 2 pi, integral 0 to pi, rs squared sine phi d phi d theta, and then you can proceed with integrating this. Now this part, if you've done the calculation before, you'll recognize that this is exactly the scalar surface element for the integration over the surface of the sphere. And this is sort of what we also did when we did the shortcut. We shown geometrically that r hat, which was the direction of f, and turns out it's, oh, and it was also this part, dot product with ds, which was, with the vector ds, which was this part, is equal to scalar ds, which we have here. And then we do cut out f of rs out of the integral. 
and we got this. And then we also before made use of the formula for the surface of uh, of the sphere, which is four pi r s squared. Um, whereas in the full derivation, you would need to integrate everything. One thing I want to mention is that we won't always be writing r s, and I think in the reading assignment you've already seen it as being written as just r. So depending on the context, r would mean either the uh, the spherical coordinate variable uh, that can change. This would be for volume integration of some charge density, or it could mean some fixed um, radius of some Gaussian surface. Um, so this is all for the left-hand side of the divergence theorem, and the variability of the problem comes in what the charge density looks like. So there are several things you can encounter. One would be continuous charge distributions, uh, for example, uniform charge distribution over some shell. So it would look something like this. You could also have shells of zero thickness of whatever radius, say, R. Um, expressions for such a shell would be theta delta of R minus the radius of the shell, and it's measured in coulombs per meter cubed, uh, just as any other charge density. Now, sigma, which is the surface charge density, would be measured in coulombs per meter squared because it's the amount of charge per unit surface of the shell. You can also find point charges. Those would come in two different forms. One is the spherical expression, which is Q over 2 pi R squared delta of R, again, coulombs per meter cubed, Oh, and I forgot to draw the point charge. Um, uh, the other expression would be Q delta of X delta Y delta Z. Also in coulombs per meter cubed. And um, this Q here is the charge of this point charge and is measured in coulombs. Now let's solve problem 11 from section 3.5 in assignment 5. In this problem, you have an infinitely long filament that's aligned with the z-axis. Um, this is the filament shown right here. And you have a spherical shell that has two radii, r1, which is the inner radius here, and R2, which is the outer radius, and you have this uh, charge density inside of this sphere. Now, let's see here. Uh, so the cylinder has charge density given by delta R divided by R in cylindrical coordinate system. Spherical shell has its charge density given in spherical coordinate system. So you see that this R and this R mean different things which is why we will use different letters to denote the two R's. So the R that's cylindrical is going to be R1, and R that is spherical is going to be R2. So R1 is the distance from the z-axis, and R2 is the distance from the origin. This means that we would label um, rho 1 as delta of R1, Delta, oops, delta of R1 divided by R1. For the second, uh, sorry, for the spherical shell, we will label this as the following. We would label it as 1 minus A times R1. Sorry, R2. Okay. And in this expression, this A is a constant. And then you are also given that F, the total field produced by the 
charged filament and the surface uh, and the spherical shell is equal to zero at a point zero two r two zero. So when the y coordinate is equal to two r two, which is right here. So this field in total, the field here is equal to zero. And the goal of this um, of this problem is to find this constant a that in that is involved in row two. Now I want you to realize that this problem isn't symmetric. Individual problem of finding field from just the filament has cylindrical symmetry. The problem of finding the field from the spherical shell is also symmetric. It has spherical symmetry. But together, when you consider the two objects at the same time, the problem is not symmetric. So what we want to do is we want to use superposition to find the field due to the filament at this point. Then we'll find the field from the shell at this point as well. Um, then we'll add them up, we'll set everything to zero, and then we'll solve for this unknown A. So let's do this. We'll start by finding the field at this point due to this filament. First, let's sketch this field. The field is going to go radially outwards from this filament. And we also know that the magnitude of the field is only going to be a function of the distance from the z-axis. That's why here I wrote that field F1 produced by this filament is equal to um, some function of, uh, function of the distance from the z-axis times r hat 1, where r hat 1 is the radial vector for cylindrical coordinates. Okay, now to find this field here, we would want to set up our Gaussian surface, which would be a cylinder for, cylind um, for problems with cylindrical symmetry. Uh, we want the Gaussian surface to pass through this point so that we get the radial component of the field, this guy, uh, at a distance 2R2 from the z-axis. So we set it up something like this something like this and then it's a cylinder like this and then the top surface looks something like this the radius of this surface is going to be 2r2 the height could be anything let's call it uh, zs this height is zs and then the, um, the normal vector of the surface is, of course, oriented outwards because in all divergence theorem problems, this is how we want to orient the normal vector. Let's simplify the flux integral, which is the left-hand side of the divergence theorem. The flux integral can be broken down into three parts corresponding to the three different parts of this surface the top, the bottom, and the side. Let me actually finish um, drawing the bottom side. Okay. Um, now you see that this closed surface uh, sign, the circle, it disappeared for these surfaces because the individual subsurfaces are not closed, right? Okay. Now, for the top surface, the normal vector is going up and so does the differential surface element. The field is going in this direction, right? Something like this, radial outward. So then you see it makes 90 degrees with the surface uh, element. This means that this dot product is going to be zero. 
So then uh, when we integrate, we're just integrating zero and we'll get zero in the, for the flux. So this is zero. The same thing happens for the bottom surface because the surface uh, element is downwards. The only thing that's left is the flux through the side surface. Um, now this, um, now let's plug in for F1, this field. Oops. This is what I did here. Uh, another thing I did is I replaced R1, which is a generic distance from the z-axis, with what this variable equals to on the surface. So the radius of this side surface. In the next step, I realized that um, R hat 1 dotted with ds is just equal to the scalar ds. The reason why is because... Well, ds on the side surface is oriented like this, and it's parallel to the r hat, r hat 1 vector. So then when you take a dot product for this side surface, you're doing r hat dotted with ds, which gives you the magnitude of r hat so 1 times magnitude of ds, which is just scalar ds, times the cosine of the angle between them, but they are parallel, so this cosine is equal to 1. This is how you get this to be equal ds. So this is ds. This is what I wrote here. In the next step, I've taken out f of r2 out of the integral. This is what I'm left with. And then this part is just equal to the surface area of the side surface. Now, this is the surface area um, that is equal to 2 pi r times, uh, times the height of the, uh, of the cylinder. So this would be 2 pi, the radius is 2r2, and the height of the cylinder is zs. This is how I got this. So this is 2 pi times the radius times zs. Now let's do, um, let's find the right-hand side of the divergence theorem, which is the charge enclosed inside of this uh, red surface. So we have the integration of rho over the volume, uh, which we'll do in cylindrical coordinates. You see dr uh, dz d theta. We should not ever forget the Jacobian, which is R1 in this case. Um, theta bounds will go from 0 to 2 pi. Z bounds will go, well, uh, we just need it to be height zs. So we could do, for example, negative zs over 2 to zs over 2. For r1, we would take 0 to the radius of the Gaussian surface. So this is it. Then here, I copied down the value for rho, the expression for rho, which is this guy. And then let's integrate. Theta integration is going to give us 2 pi. Z integration will give us Zs. Integration over R is going to give us, sorry, this is a mistake. Um, I'll fix it in the, um, in the actual notes. No, I'll fix it now. Okay, just one second, sorry. Okay. Uh, this integration uh, is everything that's left of the integration over R. Here you see the R1 cancels. That's how I got delta of R1. Bounds are the same. So this is equal to what? 
Okay, this integral um, captures only half of this delta peak because remember delta peaks at zero, but then the integration interval goes from zero to some positive number. So this only captures half of the peak. So the area instead of being one is going to be one half. So we have two pi times zs times one half. This will give us pi times zs. Now let's equate the left hand side of the divergence theorem, this guy, so I guess this one, to the right hand side of the divergence theorem, which is this. Here I just copied this. This would be, I'll actually put this on the other side, sorry. This would be the right hand side, this would be the left hand side. I copied it from here and from here. This gives us f1 of 2r2 that's equal to, let's see, pi cancels, zs cancels, and then we are left with, here we get just 1 divided by everything that's here. You see, 2 and 2 gives us 4, our 2 stays, so this is what we have radial component of f at r equals to 2r2 is equal to this. So then at this point that we're interested in, this one, our f is going to be equal to the radial component times r hat 1. Now, we don't want to keep this r hat 1 as is because we'll later want to add it to something that will be written for the spherical shell. It's hard to add things that are in different coordinate system, um, so we wouldn't want to keep this cylindrical variable. We would want to replace it with something Cartesian. And what is the Cartesian representation of r hat at this point? So at this point, this is our hat one, but it's in the y direction. You see this, right? So our hat one at this particular point is actually just equal to y hat. So then in Cartesian coordinates, this is one over four r two times y hat. Now let's find the field from the spherical shell. Now I, you probably noticed everything just got louder. I finally figured out how to make the volume at 100% for my microphone. So there you go. Um, if I just made someone deaf, I apologize. And I really hope you were able to hear up to now. Okay. Um, field from the shell. Let's do this. Uh, I've highlighted it blue. I will denote everything for this field with this blue color. Um, the field produced by the shell is directed either outwards or inwards, but its radial is actually, I know it's inwards because it needs to cancel with the field produced by the filament, but it's okay. We, you don't actually need this information to solve the problem, but I'll just draw it correctly so, um, so it doesn't blow people's minds. Okay, so this is how the field looks. It has a negative radial component, f2, which is a function of the distance from the origin, and it's directed in, well, it's directed in the negative r hat 2 direction, but then this is negative, so the direction will be correct. Um, the Gaussian surface for a sphere, as we just discussed, when we were talking about spherical uh, uh, spherical symmetries, uh, is going to be a sphere. So I will put it here, like this. And the sphere, we want to make it pass through this point, same as we did for the filament. 
So we have this sphere of radius um, equal to 2R2. The radius of this sphere equals to 2R2. For the left-hand side of the divergence uh, theorem, we have the flux integral that I based on the discussion we had before, equals to radial component of the field at this radius times the surface area of this uh, big sphere. Surface area of this big sphere is equal to 4 pi r squared, but radius of this sphere is equal to 2 r2, right? So we get this. And this is what I have right here. For the right-hand side of the divergence theorem, we have the usual integral of the charge density. Uh, now it's in spherical coordinates, uh, so we need to remember the spherical coordinate Jacobian, which is R2 squared sine phi. Here I copied the charge density. It's equal to 1 minus AR2. Theta bounds go from 0 to 2 pi because we're going all around the z-axis. Pi bounds go from 0 to pi because we go from the sort of from the top here all the way to the bottom. Bounds on R2 are going to be, now we need to be really careful here actually. So the bounds on R2 are not from 0 to 2R. They are actually wherever the charge density is. So from R1 to R2. So um, two ways to, like two things I want to explain with respect to this is the reason why it's um, only from R1 to R2 is because if we write from zero to two R, to 2R2, then we are making an incorrect claim here by writing it uh, the charge density as 1 minus AR2. If you insist on writing these bounds as 0 to the radius of the surface, then you would need to set up your bounds like this. So theta will be as before. I'm not showing you the details. For R, if you have 0 to 2R2, Instead of writing 1 minus a r2 here, you would need to write something more complicated, like 1 minus a r2 for r2 between r1 and r2 and equal to 0 otherwise. And then in the very next step, you will actually realize that this integration reduces to this. Um, also, the reason why we include the entire charge between R1 and R2 is because the Gaussian surface completely encloses the shell. So the entire charge of the shell is enclosed inside the Gaussian surface. Okay, so this is the setup. Uh, now let's evaluate the integral. Integration over theta, since there is no theta here, gives us 2 pi. Integration over phi, um, well, it takes out this guy from the integral. This is what I put here. Bounds are the same. Integration over r gives us everything that's basically left here, which is 1 minus a r2 and then r2 squared here. Now let's evaluate each part. This part is equal to this. Uh, we have negative cosine of pi from 0 to pi equals to negative cosine of pi plus cosine of 0, which is equal to negative negative 1 plus 1. So we have 1 plus 1, which is 2. I'm going to a lot skip this uh, integration because we know it's 2. For this integration, we have um, we have um, integral from R1 to R2 
of R2 squared minus A R2 cubed dr2 which is equal to r2 cubed over 3 minus a r2 to the 4 over 4 and then the bounds are r1 to r2 Now here I evaluated this expression over here, but first I wrote 2 pi times 2. This gives me gave me 4 pi. Then this integral, I got, you see this over 3 is from here. This R2 cubed is here. This R1 cubed is here. Then I have minus minus a over 4, a over 4, then r2 to the 4 with r2 and r1 plugged in. This is what I get here. Um, so this would be the right-hand side of the divergence theorem. Now let's equate the left-hand side and right-hand side and solve for the radial component at the point where we're interested in the field. Left-hand side, I copy it here. Right hand side, I copy it here. Then um, in the next step, uh, I solved for F1 at radius 2R2. Here's how I did that I canceled 4 pi. Then I wrote this whole thing, but I divided each term by this uh, factor. So this part came from here, and then I have this division minus this part. You see it's here, and then again I divided by the same thing. Then I simplified. Uh, you see this term, term turns into this. This 2 became a 4 from the square. And then multiplied by 3 gave me 12. The rest stays the same. Then I have minus. Again, the same thing here and here, but now 2 squared gave me 4. 4 times 4 is 16, which is what I got here. Um, so now we have the radial component of the field at um, on the surface of this Gaussian sphere. This means that at a point 0, 2, R2, and 0, which is at the correct distance from the origin, at the distance 2, R2, which is where we found the radial component, the field is going to be equal to the radial component we just found times the direction vector, which is R hat 2. Now again, we want it in Cartesian coordinates instead of spherical. Uh, so we figure out that at a point 0, 2, R2, and 0, this R2 hat equals 2, Y hat. Why? Because you can tell it just from looking at the picture. This is R2 hat, and Y hat is in exactly the same direction, and it's also a unit vector. Okay, so we found the field from the, uh, from the shell. Now let's get the total field equated to zero and solve for, for the unknown A. Let's remember what fields we got for each of the objects. Well, this is the field from the shell at the point 0, 2, R, 2, and 0. Field from the filament at that same point was 1 over 4 R2 Y hat. On this page, uh, what I'm showing you is I've added uh, the two fields together at this point. So this was from the filament, from the shell. Uh, y hat is the common um, vector here, so I put it out like this. And I'm setting the field to zero because I was told that the field is zero at this point. 
the only way for this vector to be zero is for this scalar to be zero. This is what I wrote here. Then I took this and I transferred it to the right hand side. This is what I got here. And in the next step, I'm solving for A. Um, the way I'm doing it is I'm first canceling factor of four here. So this is gone. This becomes three. This becomes four. So then here I have this guy, which is one over R2 plus this part. You see this is here. This three is here. And then I divide it by whatever was multiplying A, which is this stuff. So then on the um, numerator, I have this. And then denominator, I have... I mean, this knees. Oh, no, it's gone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry, guys. Um, okay. Uh, right. Um, 4R2 squared is in the denominator. Um, this is equal to... Uh, what I did here is I multiplied this guy by 3, top and bottom, because, and then I multiplied it by R2 as well. Because I want to make it common denominator with, oh my god, this is so annoying. <sighs> One second. 3, R2. Okay, uh, I made it common denominator here. So then um, this is what we have. Everything else stays the same. Now I'm canceling this common factor of one over R2 squared from the numerator and the denominator. This is how I got here. And now I'm taking this three and pulling it out. So then this three becomes this three. This four goes all the way to the top it ends up right here and then the rest stays the same this 3 r2 is here plus this stuff so everything's the same denominator again same thing but without 4 and this is it actually we found a that's all we need for this problem now since we have some time left let's do a quick problem on spherical uh, symmetry from section 5 this would be problem 9 you're given a point charge at the origin that's equal to 5 coulombs. And you're given a spherical shell with radius R1 and surface charge density sigma. And sigma is measured in coulombs per meter squared. So this would be the shell here. And the radius is equal to R1. And then you're asked to find sigma such that the field outside the shell is equal to zero. So field outside is equal to zero. Now it's not actually going to be zero inside of the shell because you're going, you have this five coulombs that produce outward field like this. And if you want, you can actually find this field. You don't need sigma to find the field inside the shell. You can just solve for it. Anyways, um, the goal is to find sigma. So let's do that. Let's set up our Gaussian surface as a sphere. The radius of the sphere is going to be um, such that the surface lies outside of this, um, of this thin shell. So this is our sphere, and its radius, our s, is greater than r1. On the left-hand side of divergence theorem, we have the flux integral, and we're told that the value of the field outside the shell is zero, which means that the value of the field everywhere on the surface is also equal to zero. And when we integrate zero field, we get zero flux. 
For the right-hand side, we need to compute the total charge enclosed inside the surface. There is two ways to do it. One is to get expressions for volume charge densities and to integrate them. This is what I'm doing here. I wrote here is the volume charge density of a point charge. It involves a delta function here. This is the expression for, um, for the shell. You can see this is the surface charge density and this is the radius of the shell. Then I'm integrating it here. Uh, integration will be in spherical coordinates. Um, bounds on theta are going to be from 0 to 2 pi. Bounds on phi are 0 to pi. Bounds on r are going to be from 0 to the radius of this Gaussian surface here. So 0 to rs. Then here we have our expression for rho. This is for the point charge. This is for the shell. We need to remember the Jacobian. Jacobian is equal to r squared sine phi when we have spherical coordinate integration. Then um, evaluating this integral, we get the following. For integration over theta, we just get 2 pi. Integration over phi, uh, well, the only thing dependent on phi is sine phi here. That's what I put here. And then the rest is for the integration over r. So you, uh, And you see I broke it into two parts, one for charge, point charge, one for the shell. For the point charge, we have the bounds, 0 to rs, integrated over dr. Here I have r squared, that stays here. Constants I pulled out of the integral, q over 2 pi, and I'm left with r squared here, and then delta of r here. For the second integral, I have basically the same thing, r squared stays here. Here I'm left with delta of r minus r1, and sigma is outside the integral. And now let's evaluate what this is equal to. Um, this part, we just computed this integral. This is equal to 2. This integration will give us the following. After we cancel r squared, we have delta of r integrated from 0 to rs. This captures half of the delta peak. Remember, delta peaks at r equals 0. This is only capturing half of this peak as a result. So the area under the curve, if we were to plot it, would be 1 half instead of 1. For this integration, uh, we need to remember the sifting or sampling property of delta functions. We have a shifted delta multiplied by some function. And we know that this guy peaks at r equals to r1, peaks at r equals r1, and this integration interval captures this r equals r1, which means that this integration will sample out this uh, quantity at r1. As a result, this integration is going to give us r1 squared. Now, here I just copied everything. I have 2 pi times 2. Um, then I have q over 2 pi, and then it's divided by 2. This is where I got q over 4 pi. Then I have plus sigma times r1 squared right here. Um, next expression, I canceled 4 pi and 4 pi here, getting q plus sigma r1 squared, sigma r1 squared, and then this 4 pi is from the outside of this bracket. Okay, so this was the first way to find the right-hand side. 
The second way to find the right hand side is by using Q and, and sigma directly. Let's remember that Q means the charge of the point charge, right? And sigma means the surface um, charge density, so amount of charge per unit surface area. So to find the total charge enclosed, we would get the charge of the point charge, which is Q, plus sigma times the surface area of the charged surface. Now I want you to see that it's charged surface, not the Gaussian surface, because Gaussian surface doesn't determine how much charge there is on this shell. So let me just label this is surface area of the shell. Okay, so this was the right hand side. Now let's equate it to the left hand side and solve for sigma. Left hand side was zero, remember right here. Right hand side I copied over here. Then sigma is equal to negative q divided by 4 pi r1 squared. Q was equal to 5 coulombs, so this is negative 5 over 4 pi r1 squared. So this is it for this problem.